God, thank you so much. Uh, the gratitude that we owe you for another day, for life and breath and all things, uh, every good gift that comes from you, uh, we could not adequately express. We don't have words to adequately uh, express the gratitude that we owe you, and yet you, thankfully, you receive our worship still. Uh, you receive our gratitude uh, eagerly and joyfully. And so, God, I pray that as we open your word uh, once again, that you would be honored by what is articulated, by the way your word's handled, by the way it's received. And God, this morning as we look again at what is your priority for your people, I do pray that Grace Bible Church would come to further embody uh, these principles, that your holiness would be what we are known for, uh, that we would be marked as a congregation by sincerity, by uprightness, by faith that is made tangible, that is evidence of what you say is true. And only you can empower those things in us. And so we pray that you would, by your grace, for your glory, and for our everlasting joy. Amen. Last week, uh, in our series on sanctification, what we began looking at was the priority that God gives this doctrine, this practice in our lives of conformity to Christ's likeness. Last week, we looked at two passages that informed our thinking on this. Ecclesiastes 12 and Colossians 1. And what we saw there was that Solomon and Paul, in their own unique ways, articulated this truth that God prioritizes for us obedience that proceeds from a fear of God. This morning, we'll continue that discussion. But to do so, I want to look at 20 convincing proofs that our holiness is God's priority. 20 convincing proofs that our holiness is God's priority. And again, as we talk about this holiness that God prioritizes for us, you should not have in mind mere external conformity to some set of rules. No matter what those rules, no matter what those laws are, even if they are the biblical ones, holiness, genuine holiness, the holiness of life that God is after, is not mere external conformity to that standard. Not even God's standard is he wanting us to merely conform to externally. What God is after is a full or a comprehensive or whole person transformation to Christ likeness. This is transformation from the inside out. At the heart level, it begins in the conscience. It begins in the inner man to be transformed truly at that level in a way that manifests itself in tangible words and deeds of righteousness. And so as we walk through these 20 convincing proofs, synonyms for holiness will be words like righteousness, obedience, sanctification, purity, uprightness. That is what we have in mind. Those things need to happen at the inward level as well as Outwardly, that is what we mean by holiness. And this all proceeds, as we've said, from a genuine fear of the Lord. A genuine fear of the Lord. People who revere God, believe Him, 
and what he has said about all things, namely about himself and his own holy character, they live a certain way. They think a certain way. They aim to feel and desire and be motivated by what God says is true. And so these 20 convincing proofs are just that. These things will prove that God prioritizes that kind of holiness. These probably will not be new to you. Hopefully they will not be new to you. But I do want to leave us with the sense that there is, an, there is overwhelming evidence that God prioritizes this in our life. This is why we exist. This is what God has for us. This is why he saves. This is our purpose. And from that, the implication for us today will be that we need to make this our one ambition, to be found pleasing to him. We need to walk away from this sermon this morning with the sense that we must prioritize our own holiness the very same way God prioritizes our own holiness. So the first convincing proof that our holiness is God's priority is first that God himself is preeminently holy. God himself is preeminently holy. And so by implication, this demands that we must be the same thing. Go to Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, starting in chapter 11. Verse 44 of Leviticus 11, and we'll be turning quite a few different places. Uh, there are many verses that we won't get to, but all of this is available to you at, in the outline on the website. So if you want a full reference of the passages, you can go to the website and see those. Leviticus 11:44 says, For I am Yahweh your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy, and you shall not make for yourselves or make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am Yahweh who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. And here in, at this point in Leviticus, God is laying down the laws for his people for what to avoid that is unclean, how to keep themselves pure. And so he drew lines in the sand about all kinds of things, things that they were not supposed to touch, not supposed to handle, not supposed to eat. It was to draw a distinction between the practices in Israel and every other nation. He wanted his people distinct or separate, holy. And the reason that he gives twice in verses 44 and 45 is that they are to be set apart. They are to be holy for the very reason that God himself is holy. Some theologians have called God's holiness his chief attribute, simply meaning that holiness marks all that God is. And so his love is a holy love. His mercy is a holy mercy. His power is a holy power. His knowledge is a holy knowledge. All of those things are set apart. They are unlike anything else. And because they are unlike anything else, they are perfect in their purity. And so because God himself is preeminently holy, then this means that we should also prioritize holiness. Listen at the way the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 articulates the same principle for New Testament Christians. Chapter 1, verse 14, As obedient children, 
do not be conformed to the former lust which you which were yours in your ignorance but like the holy one who called you be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it is written you shall be holy for i am holy they're quoting what we just read in leviticus so even in the new testament the church is called to be children marked by obedience to not be conformed to previous patterns of sinful lusts but to be like the holy one who called us holy god is preeminently holy therefore the christian must aim at holiness primarily number 2 holiness is the distinguishing characteristic of those who inherit the kingdom holiness is the distinguishing characteristic of those who inherit the kingdom old and new testament this is the case holiness marks those whom god saves and grants access to his kingdom psalm 15 is a great place to see this principle which reads a psalm of david O Yahweh who may abide in your tent who may dwell on your holy hill what David has in mind when he asks those questions is who has current and eternal rights to your abiding presence that is temporally who may abide in your tent that's going to one day go away and who may dwell on your holy hill who has access to the promises tied to this particular place the holy hills i.e. zion where the city of jerusalem is located where you have determined that your name will dwell forever where the seed of david will one day reign in a rebuilt temple as king and priest who gets right to dwell there permanently and then he answers the question The question has an answer number uh, verse 2 through verse 5 He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart Notice it is not the one who merely conforms externally to God's law it is the one who speaks truth in his heart the one who shepherds his heart to embrace God's truth to believe God's truth in the inner man that is the one who may dwell on God's holy hill he does not slander verse 3 with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor nor takes up a reproach against his friend this kind of person is the one in whose eyes a reprobate is despised but who honors those who fear Yahweh he swears to his own hurt and does not change this person does not put out his money at interest nor does he take a bribe against the innocent he who does these things will never be shaken i.e. removed from these land promises removed out of the land uh cast off from God's enduring promises and his presence this person will never be shaken that kind of holiness characterizes the one who inherits the kingdom and Jesus in the new testament namely the sermon on the mount articulates the same principle that kingdom citizens are marked by genuine righteousness in the sermon on the mount matthew chapters 5 through 7 this is the principle that jesus is articulating notice in first off the beatitudes The beatitudes contain a blessing followed by the ca- the characteristic of those who inherit that blessing and then a future looking promise to those individuals. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. 
Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In each of these, a pronouncement of blessing followed by a character quality or some practice of genuine godliness in this life, and then a future forward-looking promise. The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the gentle, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, peacemakers, those who are persecuted and maligned for the sake of righteousness, all have these promises. The kingdom of heaven, they will be comforted. They will inherit the earth or literally the land. They will be satisfied. They will receive mercy. They will see God. They will be called sons of God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They have those rights currently for a future reality is what is in view. And so because this is what Jesus says marks kingdom citizens, then you must prioritize holiness if you would have the assurance of entering into the kingdom. To put it the other way, if these qualities do not characterize you, then you have no assurance of the kingdom. As these are yours and increasing, these provide an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. 2 Peter chapter 1. just so that we don't mistake the righteousness that Jesus is describing, he is not describing, even in the Beatitudes or in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, things that are um, just positionally true of every Christian. These are things that you actually have to strive for, not things that you inherit by virtue of belief in the gospel. Things like justification and forgiveness and redemption, you don't have to work for those things. You don't have to work for adoption. You do have to strive to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You do have to strive for being a peacemaker. And so that tangible practice of righteousness, practical godliness, is certainly what Jesus is after. Because in verse 20 of chapter 5, he reiterates, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about a positional righteousness. He is talking about a tangible, visible righteousness that proceeds from true godliness at the heart level. The, the Pharisees did not possess that kind of godliness. They possessed mere conformity to external laws. That's why they could tie herbs, every tenth part of worthless herbs, and devour widows' houses in the process and not do justice, the weightier matters of the law. So Jesus is aiming for a genuine godliness that is not hypocritical. It's sincere and proceeds from the heart. He even helpfully includes that in verse 8. It's the pure in heart who will see God. The third convincing proof that our holiness is God's priority is that God's glory depends on our godliness. God's own glory depends on our godliness. 
obviously not the godly the the glory that he possesses in himself. God was glorious before there was anything to acknowledge his glory, before anything was created to declare his glory, God was already glorious. And so we can't add anything to God's glory. That glory, the glory, the glory that he possesses by virtue of being God, does not depend on us. But the received glory, the glory that God receives that is acknowledged, that does depend on our godliness. Jesus says so in verse 16 of the same chapter of Matthew. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works, that's your obedience, and do something in response to your good works. Glorify your Father who is in heaven. That is the God-desired, God-ordained response when people see our obedience to him, that they would worship him as God, that they would acknowledge God the Father. 1 Timothy 3 articulates the same principle as Paul is laying out for Timothy the importance of the instructions that he has been giving him in this letter. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul says, I write to you in case I am delayed so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself. That has conformity to some standard. But sincerely, not just externally, but even inwardly, Paul is writing so that the church, the various members of the church, would know how to conduct themselves as members of God's household, because they are the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So God's reputation as father depends on the conduct of his children. Just like you parents of younger children, your parenting is demonstrated in the conduct of your children. Jesus says that wisdom is justified by her children. The proof that wisdom is being exercised is the fruit of it in the life. And he uses parenting terminology to highlight the obviousness of that principle, of that proverb. So God's reception of glory depends on our own godliness. Do you prioritize holiness because you prioritize the glory of God? If you don't prioritize the glory of God, then you will never prioritize holiness. And if you prioritize genuine holiness, the kind of holiness that God is after, it will only be because you prioritize the glory of God. The fourth convincing proof that our holiness is God's prioritize or is, is our prior, is God's priority, excuse me. Number four is that our sanctification is God's own will. Flip back, if you're in First Timothy, just a, a couple books to First Thessalonians chapter four. Paul just says that. Our sanctification is God's will. This is God's will for your life. If you're wondering this morning, what is God's will for my life? Look no further. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. What is God's will? God's will is your holiness. God's will is your sanctification, that you would live like somebody who knows God, not like people who don't know God, who are devoid of holiness. The fifth convincing proof that our holiness is God's priority is that both the law and the gospel message prioritize God-fearing obedience. 
the law and the gospel message prioritize God-fearing obedience. This is so helpful to see the continuity between the Old and New Testament in this regard. The Old Testament is aiming primarily at one thing, God-fearing obedience. The New Testament is aiming at primarily one thing. It is God-fearing obedience. First Timothy, again, just captures this in, in one passage. Uh, it ties both Testaments together in their purpose for the hearers. Because they're the occasion that warrants such teaching from Paul is the teachers in Ephesus are misusing the law. They are misusing Moses' words in the Old Testament by standing up before the congregation and here is what they have given their attention to. Verse 4, myths and endless genealogies. They have begun to teach other doctrines, verse 3 says. Translations render this strange doctrine, but it's not like bizarre stuff, you know, flat earth. That, that is strange doctrine. They weren't teaching bizarre stuff like that. They were teaching just other doctrine, things outside of Scripture, even though they were using the Bible to do it. They were giving their attention as they taught these other doctrines, to myths and endless genealogies, and the effect that that had on the church in Ephesus, verse 4 tells us, these give rise to mere speculation. Mere speculation. How is that of any value to the people of God? It is not of any value to the church. For you to hear, maybe even someone preach with the Bible open, and to be left wondering about what is true, speculating about what might be truth, instead of get, get, uh, gaining clarity from God's word, that's not helpful. That's not what God intends for his people. To walk away from the teaching of his word with less clarity. But that's what was happening in Ephesus. Just jump down to verse 7. The reason I say they were using the law to do this is because verse 7 says that these men were wanting to be teachers of the law even though they were ignorant. <laughs> they didn't understand either what they were saying or the matters about which they made confident assertions. Ignorance in a teacher is fatal because it produces ignorance in the hearers. But they were wanting to be teachers of the law. Think about that. New Testament teachers with New Testament doctrine handling the Old Testament words of God taught to a New Testament church this is what these men were doing, was merely pr producing speculations in the hearers. And so what does Paul have to do? He has to, again, articulate afresh the purpose for which all biblical instruction exists, even the Old Testament as well as the New. Verse 8, but we know, so in contrast to the ignorance of the teachers in verse 7, we actually know some things. <laughs> We know that the law is good with this condition if one uses it lawfully. Realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. 
that is sound teaching, which is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I, that is Paul, has been entrusted. The law is good if it's used lawfully. It is intended for sinners, people who sin, people who would act in a way contrary to sound doctrine, even sound doctrine that's in keeping with New Testament teaching, New Testament revelation with which Paul was entrusted, this glorious gospel. So the law is out to sanctify sinners. And that accomplishes the same thing that the glorious gospel is also intended to do. It is by the same standard of the teaching of the gospel with which Paul was entrusted. Both are aiming at one thing. Look at verse 5. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love. The goal of our instruction is love, but not just any kind of love, love from any kind of person. This is particularly love that proceeds from three things, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Genuine piety inwardly. Inward piety. Love that manifests itself, that's external acts, deeds that proceed from inward holiness of life. That's the goal of all biblical instruction, and that's number six. Godliness is the goal of biblical instruction. The law and the gospel message prioritize obedience that proceeds from a holy life inwardly from God-fearing obedience, and number six, godliness is the goal of biblical instruction, as we saw there in verse five. The same thing is articulated in Titus chapter one, uh, two, that section where Paul identifies older men, older women, younger women, and younger men. So every category of people in the body who are to receive instruction Paul tells Titus in chapter 2, verse 1, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. And then he tells them particularly to train the various people in the church for godliness. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself, Titus, to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Sounds like in teaching sound doctrine, what Paul is after is the purity of the lives of the people. He's after sanctification. When you sit under biblical instruction, in all of your getting, as you get understanding, do you aim to increase an understanding for the purpose of godliness? Are you prioritizing godliness the way God prioritizes godliness for you? We must be about this. The seventh convincing proof that holiness is God's priority is because even the Great Commission, even the Great Commission is about the multiplication of obedient disciples. Obedience is at the heart of the Great Commission. This is what the Great Commission is primarily about. Matthew 28, verse 18 says this, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, that is, his disciples gathered there, saying, 
all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission, what Jesus does with all authority at his disposal in heaven and on earth, what would you do with that kind of authority? Here's what Jesus does with that kind of authority. Limitless authority, what he wants is reproduction of his own image. Jesus wants people baptized first as the entrance into discipleship and then the ongoing activity of making disciples is teaching them to observe or keep or obey commandments. Not just the commandments they like, but this says, all that I commanded you, disciples. The end of discipleship, the goal of discipleship, is obedience to absolutely everything that Jesus has commanded. That is God's will for you. That is Christ's will for you as a member of the church. Are you as zealous as a member of the church for obedience as Jesus is zealous for your obedience. We must be. You'll notice even in verse 20, it is particularly as the church, as the, the disciples who are commissioned to reproduce churches as its uh, very foundation even, in the apostles, it is as they are carrying out this commission that Jesus promises his abiding presence with them even to the end of the age. That's not a promise just for every single Christian. It is true that God is with every single Christian. Uh, but this passage particularly has in mind Christ's presence as his disciples obey this commissioning, this task of reproducing disciples. So if you are wondering where Jesus is in the world, you need to look for a church that's prioritizing repro the reproduction of obedient disciples, not other stuff. The eighth that's the eighth convincing proof that our holiness is God's priority. God's favorable presence requires obedience. God's favorable presence requires obedience. His favorable presence with churches corporately requires obedience, as well as with individual men and women. We just saw one Place in Matthew 28 where he promises his favorable presence with the church who is obeying these commands. The same thing is on display in Revelation chapter 2 to a particular church. Again, the church in Ephesus. Jesus speaking, uh, revealing this to John, says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, Right? This is verse 1. To the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, say this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. Great. That's the, the, the church's benefit and commendation that they did these things. But he says in verse 3, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. 
But I have this against you, verse 4, that you have left your first love. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. So the presence of Christ, the, this one who walks among the lampstands, says he will remove it if they do not repent, if they are not obedient to what God has called them to. And that, in, in this passage, he calls their first love, the deeds which they did at first. So God's favorable presence requires obedience. The same thing is on display in, in church uh, discipline. The church that's faithfully obeying Jesus' requirements about confronting members who are in sin and seeing that process through where there is not repentance, Jesus says that where those one or two witnesses are gathered, he is there in their midst as judge as they, with the church, render the judicial sentence against the sinning member. And so these practices in church discipline and carrying out the Great Commission and maintaining adherence to our first love, this ensures God's favorable presence with us. Number nine is that obedience is the essence of love. Obedience is the essence of love, and that is a convincing proof that God prioritizes our holiness. Some people have drawn a distinction between these two things, love and obedience, as if the goal of life is really to love God. It's not primarily about obeying God. It's more about loving God. Love for God should be preeminent. That should be our preeminent pursuit. And maybe that sounds more winsome Maybe that sounds uh, more well-received, like it'll be likely to be better received because, you know, we like love. Who doesn't like love? But God doesn't draw a distinction between love and obedience. Think of this in two ways. Love for God is obedience to God, and love for men tangible, tangibly is manifestations of godliness. We'll see this in a couple ways. First, First John chapter 5 actually says that this is love. Listen at First John verse three, uh, chapter 5 verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. There it is. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Love is obedience. Love for God is obedience to God, as defined by the Apostle John. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that popular passage on love, as Paul seeks to help this church love one another with their God-given spiritual gifts, when he describes love, notice that his description includes what are tangible expressions of godliness. Verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Love rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love is not a feeling. 
love is these godly characteristics. So even love on a horizontal level to one another is manifested godliness. Number 10, holiness is the essence of the fear of God and wisdom. Holiness is the essence of the fear of God and wisdom. And those things are so closely associated together. We'll just, we take them together. Job 28, 28. Here's the definition of wisdom. Here's the definition of understanding. And he said to man, that is God said to man, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. The fear of the Lord equals wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. To turn away from evil equals understanding or wisdom. So in this, you have three things all having an equal sign between them. The fear of the Lord equals wisdom, which is understanding, equals turning away from evil. Godliness, holiness, turning away from evil. Again, that's internally and externally. That is what the fear of the Lord is. That is wisdom. Holiness is the essence of the fear of God and wisdom. And you can write down Proverbs 3, verse 7, chapter 8, verse 13, chapter 14, verse 2, and chapter 16, verse 6, all in Proverbs. They articulate the same principle. To fear the Lord means to be holy, to turn away from evil, to do what is right. Number 11, the 11th convincing proof that our holiness is God's priority is that Christ died for this very purpose. Christ died to sanctify believers. Jesus died to sanctify believers. Titus chapter 2 says this very thing. Listen to Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Christ Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Why did Jesus die? Not only to redeem us from lawless deeds, not just to rescue us from this, the penalty of, of sin, but also for sanctification, to purify for himself a people, for his own possession. Zealous for good deeds. In other words, Jesus didn't die for any other kind of person than the one zealous for good deeds. If you are not zealous for good deeds, you have no assurance that Jesus actually died for you. Jesus died to purify people zealous for good deeds. If you want to walk in confidence that Jesus died for you, be zealous for good deeds. You can know you are saved. You can know that God has done a purifying work in your life if you pursue his good deeds, good deeds on his terms. Fearing God and obeying him tangibly in life, you can have the confidence that what Jesus did on the cross was effective for you, Christian, if you are zealous for good deeds. Number 12, salvation is about this same thing. Salvation is about transformation unto Christ-likeness. Transformation unto Christ-likeness is exactly what God is after in salvation. Just to give you one passage, Ephesians 2.10, in reference to this change that God has brought about to people who were once spiritually dead, who, verse 8 says, have been saved by grace through faith, 
that being from God? Verse 10 says why God did this. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Why did God save you, Christian? Why did he transform you? Why did he rescue you from bondage to sin? For good works. Look, he even prepared them beforehand so that we would walk in them. God is after good works when he saves us. Again, not for the sake of good works, ultimately, but because in us walking in those good works, they glorify him, they bring him honor. That is why he has created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Election was for the same purpose, so that we would be conformed to the image of his beloved son. Our calling, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, says that we were called in holiness. We were not called to impurity, but we were called in holiness. Holiness is the purpose for which God called us effectually in salvation. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4, say that there is forgiveness with you so that you might be feared. So even forgiveness exists so that we would fear or obey God so that we would live in the fear of him. Your assurance in salvation requires your obedience. If you don't obey God, you don't deserve assurance. It's not a right for you to have. How would you even know if you're saved? And on what basis would you be assured if you are not obedient. Those who have a right to assurance of salvation are those who obey God. No Christian should balk at that. First John proves that over and over again. Chapter 3, verse 10 in First John says this, By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who practices righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. If you want it to be obvious to yourself and others that you are a child of God, practice righteousness and love the brethren. If you do not love the brethren, if you do not zealously pursue the good of the other children of God, the household of God, you should lack assurance. And if you find yourself lacking assurance, this is helpful. Because what does it mean? God has not left you in the dark about how to gain assurance. You can be confident. God desires your confidence if you are truly his. And so he lays before you a variety of good works that he's predestined for you to walk in, And so all you must do is submit your will to his and walk in the good deeds he's prepared for you and watch your confidence in your own salvation increase. Your glorification is ultimately about this. Lastly, in salvation, your glorification is about this same thing. David looked forward to this same reality according to Psalm 15 or 1715. Psalm 17, chapter 15. Here's what David says. As for me, I'm not satisfied with the best of this life, like the wicked are. The wicked are satisfied with children, according to verse 14. But David says, verse 15, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. That's resurrection language. David is looking forward to awaking, right? After he's dead, he's looking forward to awaking in a resurrection when he is satisfied with your likeness. And you'll notice the awaking language is important 
because David has not experienced that yet. David's satisfaction has not come. David is looking forward to being resurrected when he inherits the kingdom that he was longing for while he lived. He's not satisfied until he has soul and body perfected and sees his descendant reigning on his throne in Jerusalem in his kingdom. We can learn a thing or two from David. I've got five minutes to get through eight more. So here it is. I'll just give them to you. The final convincing proof that our holiness is God's priority is that God disciplines his children for the sake of their holiness. This is what God's after even in discipline, Hebrews 12.10 says. But he disciplines us so that we might share in his holiness. That includes church discipline, that includes pangs of conscience that God brings, that includes more general training that God introduces into our lives through hardship and suffering. God's training us for holiness so that proves what his priority is for us. Number 14, obedience is the proper response to God's blessings. All of the good things that God has done spiritually and temporally are intended to produce obedience in us. Joseph is a great example in Genesis 39, verses 7 through 9, where he tells Potiphar's wife, look at everything that, all the good that I have. How could I sin against God in this way? He counts God's temporal blessings as motivation to obey God. And then all of God's spiritual blessings in salvation, Romans 6 and 1 Peter 2, demonstrate exist for the sake of obedience. If you have tasted that the Lord is good. Obedience is the proper response to God's blessings. Number 15, the blessing of God depends on obedience. And number 16, the curse of God depends on obedience. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 Those famous chapters in the Mosaic Covenant where Moses said, if you obey, here are the blessings. If you disobey, here are the curses. So God's blessings and curses depended on Israel's obedience. God made it that way. And God's favor, or lack thereof, depends practically on our obedience. Number 17, godly boldness depends on upright living. You can write down Proverbs 14, 26, and 28, verse 1. The righteous are bold as a lion, even though the wicked flee when no one pursues. You want to have a godly confidence, a boldness in this life? Then don't have an impure conscience. Live a righteous life, and you won't be looking over your shoulder at who's watching, because it won't matter. You're blameless. Godly boldness depends on upright living. Number 18, usefulness depends on our own purity. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 say so. The one who purifies himself will be a vessel useful to the master. You want to be useful as a believer in God's household? Pursue holiness of life. Number 19, our joy depends on our submission to God. Our joy depends on our submission to God. It's silly to make joy as, as, as a feeling the ultimate pursuit of the Christian life out ahead of obedience. Because to even be joyful the way God intends, you know what you have to do? You have to obey passages like Philippians 4.4 and 1 Thessalonians 5.16 that commands rejoicing. You can't rejoice unless you obey. You can't please God in your rejoicing unless that rejoicing is a matter of obedience. So you can't separate biblical joy from biblical obedience. To be joyful biblically is to obey biblically. Biblically. 
And then finally, the pursuit of righteousness is commanded. The pursuit of righteousness is commanded. You know, lest someone think righteousness just happens without me going after good works and making a big deal about good works. I'm supposed to just pursue Christ and righteousness just happens. That's not the case. They're in tandem with each other. And Paul says multiple times, uh, famously to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 11, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue not just God, but righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And then he says the same thing in 2 Timothy 2.22. Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We should be unashamed about pursuing holiness because we love God, because we fear God, because we believe God, and we want to bring him honor. We must prioritize holiness. Let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, for these truths, and we are... We can't, we, we are unable, despite how much we might know that this is a priority, without your help and divine enabling, we would be at a loss and it would be impossible for us to look like Christ. That is a divine work that we need you to work in us so that we possess sincerity of heart from which proceeds great love, love for you and love for others. And we do pray that you would make it actual, all for your glory, for your great namesake. We pray these things. Amen.